Good evening. Uh, I'm Mike Bloom, and I have the privilege of being the chapter chair this year for the MIT Enterprise Forum. I'd like to welcome all of you on behalf of all of us. And I'd like to first give a special thanks to our sponsors for this evening's event and for us throughout the year. Sutherland, Silicon Valley Bank, Austin and Bird, TechDraw, Our Capita, Miller and Martin, Safar, Carlton Field, and McKesson. We're going to be brief on the front end with our remarks because, quite frankly, we have such a packed program and it's a real treat to have Pam with us. Jim Black is going to introduce our speaker for this evening. And some years ago, he and his wife Marilyn founded the Apollo Grant at Trinity School. This grant, along with Jim and Marilyn, brought astronaut Pam Melroy to Atlanta and provided financial support for this evening. And at this time, I think we really should give Marilyn and Jim a round of applause. Many of you will know Jim as soon as he gets up here. He is one of the founders of the chapter of the MIT Enterprise Forum. He served as chapter chair and continued as a chapter board member until 2007. He has also served on the Global Forum Board in Cambridge. Uh, he's an alum of MIT, the Harvard Business School, and a successful entrepreneur here. In fact, he's a serial entrepreneur, and some days we refer to him as a bit of an entrepreneurial zealot. Uh, we thank you very much, Kent, for coming this evening. Jim. Thanks to all of you. Uh, forgive me, I've, loose, I've been losing my voice today, uh, but I will welcome you all. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, I'm not sure being a, a uh, serial anything is particularly complimentary, so I prefer to be known as a new enterprise zealot, and uh, that fits me better than any other description. Uh, tonight, we have 226 of you registered. That's terrific. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I know you're eager to go hear Colonel Melroy. So am I. Um, it's a great honor to introduce this lady. She's a remarkable. And, and uh, I want to thank her for her outstanding service to our country. Uh, she has been in the service of our country since graduating from Wellesley. I promised her that I would not read the bio of her incredible accomplishments. I encourage you, though, to read it. It's in the program in front of you. What's not there is a vivid picture of Wellesley College campus, especially this time of year. Every MIT guy is introduced early on to the pristine all-girls college in the rolling hills, just a short distance away. But miles and miles and miles from the stark, gray, urban campus that is MIT. <laughs> Wellesley was and still is the most beautiful place I've ever seen. And if you've never been there, and if you have daughters that are considering college, you should always put Wellesley on your candidate list. Proof of that, actually, was the reaction of my younger sister when she first saw the college, and my eldest daughter, who both graduated from Wellesley, some 23 years apart. How fitting that when Mel and I were searching for an astronaut to visit Trinity School, to our surprise, we discovered Colonel Pam Melroy a Wellesley and MIT alum. Not only is she a remarkable astronaut, and this is the part I like better than that, she's a remarkable test pilot. 
Did you see she's flown more than 50 different aircraft? Can you imagine that? And she's a woman. I think, I think it's just simply remarkable, and maybe she'll address that. What an inspiration for young students. The perfect Apollo resident for Trinity. But how attractive. Can you imagine? We discovered that we have the perfect resident, and we had no idea how to approach her. We were blessed again with a wonderful coincidence. An Atlanta resident, our friend from business school, Bunny Winter. Many of you know Bunny. She serves on the Wellesley Board of Trustees along with Pam. Thank you, Bunny, for being the connector that made this visit possible. Someone, one of my attorneys suggested that I not say the next thing, but I tell attorneys, you guys have no fun and I'm not listening to you. Wellesley's Old Girl Network does exist, and it works. Thanks, Bunny. Bunny and her husband are here. It will and will not have happened without you, Bunny. Thank you so much. Finally, we still had to navigate the NASA protocol, which was daunting at first. But at that point, we had Pam's guidance through it. What we quickly discovered though, was that only one woman in all of the astronaut, in all of the astronaut corps, who was both, there was only one woman in all the astronaut corps, who was both a shuttle commander and a test pilot. Wow. She's here. We have an astronaut in the house. <laughs> She's about to speak. Then there was one term in the bio I didn't understand. If you guys have read her bio by now, you're probably having the same problem. CAPCOM. CAPCOM. C-A-P-C-O-M. I have never encountered that term. What in the world does that mean? It's capsule communicator. Still didn't make a lot of sense. It's the one and only person in mission control who communicates with the spacecraft crew from launch to splash down. It is an amazingly important role. It, I thought, wow, perfect. I now give you CAPCOM, <laughs> Colonel Pamela Melroy, who is going to communicate her experiences in our space. Definitely the most fun introduction I've ever had. <laughs> that was fun. Thank you. Thank you for a very warm welcome. It is wonderful to be here. Uh, I just absolutely love the opportunity uh, to talk to people, but especially I'm really happy to see all the students in the audience. And that will become clear as I tell the story a little bit about why I'm happy to see you, because I have something to tell you uh, that I think you'll be very interested in. Uh, hopefully everybody will be interested in some of the other stories as well. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how I became an astronaut and uh, then I'm going to talk about my third mission in space which was STS-120 and uh, I was the commander on that mission. I, it was about two years ago and uh, we had an interesting experience which makes for a fun story to tell and I think shares a little bit about what the experience of being an astronaut is like. And then I'm going to talk about the connection of the space program uh, in the future to the students in the audience. And then we're just going to take a step back and we're going to go to space together through a video, which is just going to be fun and we'll be setting the stage to talk about that. One of the things that I find interesting about being an astronaut is that people have this uh, expectation that I, I, they just kind of don't believe you really come from anywhere. Even with an introduction, it's not really real to them that at some point you were a student and you were a child. And so I always make a point of talking about my background. Let's see if I can get my slides going here. 
get the technology working. There we go. Um, this is a picture of me when I was two years old. My mother caught me in the garden. I was wearing my father's Air Force flight cap, and I was impersonating an Air Force officer, <laughs> which is a crime. <laughs> However, instead of punishing me, my parents took the approach of encouraging me and telling me that there was nothing that I couldn't do. I just want to take a moment and say how important the support of my family has been uh, through the experience of becoming an astronaut. And in fact, I'm really thrilled to have my cousin Paul in the audience here somewhere. Where are you, Paul? Raise your hand. There you go. And his family, uh, Robin and Samantha and Zach, are with us tonight. And so that's very, they're Atlanta uh, residents. And so it's really wonderful to have family support here tonight as well. But I just want to uh, bring up the point that all of us started somewhere. Everyone was a student once. And so it's so incredibly important to send that message to our students about what the possibilities of the future are. For me, it was always about the sky. I was always fascinated with the sky. Everything to do with the sky fascinated me. So I started with astronomy. And that's what I studied when I was at Wellesley. And at MIT, I studied uh, planetary atmospheres. And so these are the two places I did that, at Whiten Observatory at Wellesley and, of course, the Green Building at MIT, two places very important to my past and uh, the places that I treasure. I went through ROTC at MIT. Uh, this is uh, actually on the fields uh, at MIT, and this is on Severance Lawn at Wellesley, getting my commission from uh, the father of my best friend in college, who was a Navy captain. So obviously, an, a tremendously important part of my background uh, as the first step on my way to becoming an astronaut. For me, I chose to go into the military because the only astronauts that I knew about were military jet test pilots. Now, I'd like to mention the fact that until I was a sophomore in high school, women weren't allowed to do that. But I never let that stop me. I always knew that's exactly what I wanted to be. And so the doors opened up just one step ahead of me. But I think the fact that my parents encouraged me, I, I, just, didn't, I just took it for granted that it was all going to happen and it was all going to work out. So I did go into the Air Force. I flew uh, for several years as an operational pilot. Uh, I went to the, uh, lived in this tent city here in the first Gulf War. And in fact, uh, just as I was preparing to fly a combat mission over Iraq during that Gulf War, I got the news that I'd been accepted to the Air Force Test Pilot School. So that was, of course, my dream and my goal. Uh, being a test pilot is totally cool because it's experiments with airplanes. So you get to do the engineering and the science, and I got to do this thing that I loved so much, which was flying airplanes. And it was a fascinating job and very exciting. There was one thing and one thing only that I would leave it for, and that was to be an astronaut. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my third mission now. I uh, was started in, gosh, 1995 as an astronaut, and I've flown three missions. This, uh, again, was my third, so I was the commander on it, STS-120. Each crew designs their own mission patch. So I'd like to introduce you to the crew. This is obviously me in the middle as the commander. And next to me is George Zamka. He's a Marine test pilot on his first mission. So he was my pilot. So he's responsible for all the systems. And uh, I was obviously the commander of the flight and also a pilot. So it was my job to train him to be a commander on his next mission. Over here, we have Dr. Scott Parazinski. You're going to see a lot about Scott. He was my lead spacewalker, very experienced on his sixth flight in space, very, very experienced spacewalker. And uh, he has a medical background. He's an emergency medicine doctor. Next to him was Stephanie Wilson. She was on her second flight. So if Scott was my right-hand guy, she was my left-hand gal. Her expertise was as a robotic specialist. So she operated both the shuttle and the station robot arm. And sometimes she was so busy, she would literally operate one arm, set the brakes, and then float over to the other vehicle and then operate that arm. So she was very busy on the mission. Behind Scott and Stephanie is Doug Wheelock, or Wheels, as we affectionately call him. He's an Army helicopter test pilot on his first flight, and he went out on spacewalks with Scott. Down at this end, we have Paolo Nespoli, an Italian who was a European Space Agency astronaut on his first flight. Next to him, Dan Tani. Dan wore two hats on this mission. He was a mission specialist on my crew. He went out on one spacewalk with Scott, and he operated the robotic arm with Stephanie. 
But the other responsibility that he had was as a space station crew member. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Here is an artist's rendition of the way the space station is going to look in just about a year when we finish building it. We have been building, building this space station since 1998. My first mission in 2000 was to attach the third piece to this vehicle. So what we have right now is very similar to what you see in this picture. I'd like to point out a couple key features. This is sort of the living area in the middle here, and these are all the laboratories. Because this is a laboratory in the sky, what is the purpose of a space station? It's to do science in space. As you know, you change one parameter at a time in an experiment. Changing gravity is a pretty big parameter, and it's really hard to do on Earth. So we are doing some amazing science not only on the human body, but also on materials. That's some of the most interesting stuff. And in addition, I really like the stuff that we're doing on flame propagation to make engines more efficient. So there's a lot of really interesting science, but the medical stuff is probably primary right now. We also have this large engineering truss. I mean, this, with that, the purpose of that truss is to hold the weight and the mass of those four solar arrays. Solar arrays are how we generate power in space. Obviously, we need a lot of power to run all those laboratories and to keep the humans alive. And so we designed it to run off solar power. Our part in this mission, because this is what we have been doing with the space shuttle for since 1998, with the exception of a few Hubble missions, we have been going to the space station. My entire career has been about building this vehicle, one piece at a time. And the shuttle is an extraordinary vehicle because it can carry a large chunk. And in our case, we were carrying Node 2, known as Harmony. It's the hub of the international laboratories. It's also serving as a secondary crew quarters to allow us to ramp up from three people on the space station to six, serving a very, very important purpose. It was exciting, too, because we hadn't added a new habitable volume to the space station in several years. So it was exciting to be bringing up kind of a place to make the house bigger. The other part of our responsibility was to move this solar array. At the very beginning of the space station's history, before the truss was built, we still had to have electrical power. So we stacked this solar array on top of the living area. However, the final location was at the end of this truss. So the flight before us furled up this solar array, so retracted it nice and tight, and it was our job to lift it move it out to the end using the space station robot arm, attach it, and deploy it. The final part of our mission was to exchange crew members. I mentioned that Dan was staying aboard the space station. Well, he was replacing Clay Anderson, our Nebraska astronaut, who had been living aboard the space station for five months, and we were bringing him home to his family, which is a mission that anybody could get excited about. The other thing I'd like to mention, and this happened completely accidentally, which was really fun and exciting, is that my friend Peggy Whitson just happened to be the first woman to command the International Space Station, and it just so happened that as the second woman shuttle commander, we were in space at the same time. And I have to tell you, there was never any doubt in my mind from the time I was 11 years old that I was going to command a space mission. Never any doubt. I always knew it. But never in a million years would I have thought that two women would be commanding two spacecraft at the same time in space. And it happened completely by accident, which was very exciting for us. So it was a very special moment for our friendship and for history. So how do we get ready to go to space? This is one of the places that I have spent a lot of time in the last 14 years. It's the shuttle simulator. It's set up, it's hooked up to mission control, and it's hooked up to a bunch of extremely evil people in the training center. <laughs> so basically what they do is they give you malfunctions, and when you figure them out, they give you harder ones. And then when you're really good at that, then they throw mission control in the mix, and you have to learn how to work together to solve your problems. So a huge amount of time is spent in the shuttle training simulator. We also fly the T-38. Flying the space shuttle every couple of years is not enough to be good at your landings. You have to keep practicing them at least every 30 or 45 days. So this is the aircraft we do that in. 
the pilot astronauts sit up front and our engineering and scientist astronauts sit in the back and we work together as a team. We also practice by using the robotic arm, which I've already mentioned. Stephanie was our robotic arm specialist. She was a, the goddess of the arm. So the, what is the robotic arm? Well, this is the shuttle robotic arm. It's like a human arm. It's attached at the shoulder, and it rotates, and the elbow moves, and the wrist, and you can grab hold of things with it. What you see in this picture is the robotic arm of the shuttle holding a long pole called the boom. The boom has a camera on the end of it, and we use it to inspect the space shuttle after every launch. You'll hear a little bit more about the boom later, too. Here's the space station robotic arm. Space station robotic arm, both of them, by the way, built by Canada, known as Canadarm1 and Canadarm2. The space station robotic arm is double jointed. It goes in ways that a human arm could never go. You can spin it all the way around. But more importantly, it can move around the space station because it has grapple fixtures at either end. And that's really important. As the space station has gotten big, there's no way that the shuttle arm can be used to extend new pieces and attach them to the space station. So that's what we're using the robotic arm of the space, shuttle, space station for. And of course, spacewalking, a very important part of our training. Just because you've used the robot arm to take a piece out of the payload bay of the shuttle and mechanically attach it, you also have to make all the connections. You need power, you need electricity, you need the telephone, you need internet, you need all those things in order to live and work in that area. And that is what our spacewalkers do. And how they practice and prepare for that, because we obviously don't have a microgravity generator here on the Earth, is we practice in a neutral buoyancy laboratory. If you've been scuba diving, you know what neutral buoyancy means. It means you don't float to the surface, you don't sink to the bottom. Using a combination of air and weights, the crew members in their suits float neutrally buoyant, and that's as close as we can get here on the Earth to prepare them for their spacewalks. We also have to integrate, because the spacewalkers frequently get into a step stool at the end of the robotic arm, and to hang on and move big pieces around. So how do we coordinate that? Our, we use virtual reality. So our spacewalkers put on the helmet, and then everything that they see matches with a model that our robotic specialists are operating from. So they move the arm, and that's what the spacewalker sees. So the spacewalker says, two feet to the right, Stephanie. And Stephanie moves the arm, and he gets the right visuals. So that's how we integrate and practice some very complex tasks. One of the most complex tasks we have to practice, too, is living together. So it's a very unique work environment. You do not go home at the end of the day. You are home. So this small area here, about the size of a minivan, is our bedroom, our bathroom, our kitchen, and our living room. And all seven of us have to fit in it. So this is a tremendous challenge. And what you don't want to find is when you get on orbit that you have problems in this area. So how do we train for that? We go camping. <laughs> it's a great model. Through the National Outdoor Leadership School, where we have guides that take us. I took the crew up to Alaska, and yeah, that's ice. Sea kayaking for about 10 days, which is you know, pretty close to the shuttle model of two weeks. Every day we loaded up our kayaks and we paddled anywhere from 10 to 25 uh, miles. We planned it in advance. You have to do, use some risk management here because all of us are over 30 and several of us were over 40. So what that means is we all have orthopedic issues. <laughs> yeah. So it's actually a great model for the physical risks that you take in space to plan around that as a crew, to set your targets appropriately and work together as a team to safely achieve them. And then once you achieve your goal, you unpack, you set up two tents, and you cook dinner together. You learn everything that you need to know about how to work and live together. You find out how people feel and how they behave when they get tired. And who gets really cranky if she isn't fed three times a day? That would be me. That's me. So I tell everybody, but they don't believe it until they really see it. The goal, of course, is to try to create a team. We are more than a team. We are a family. And to that end, we actually also extend this to our own personal families. And that's a very important thing. Your social life revolves around your crew. 
Your family social life also does, whether they want to or not. This is one of my favorite family photos. That's my husband and his two sons. And that's me way up there, right out of the picture. So, so it, it's important to bring all the families together to understand what we're trying to achieve and work together. It, nothing less will do. So I'm going to show you some great videos, so I'm not going to talk about the shuttle launch right now, except to say that it's a very exciting experience. And I will also talk for just a moment about the amazing experience of seeing our beautiful Earth from space. You go around the Earth every 90 minutes, so every 45 minutes you get a sunrise or a sunset. And what's really cool about it is that now here on Earth, if you want to watch a sunrise and see all the shades of pink and orange and blue and purple as they change with time, you'll sit and you'll watch it unfold over a period of time. When you're in space, you look down, you can see the light, you can see the dark, you can see the entire sunset beneath you all at once. You see all of the colors, all of the shades, all of those dynamics happening at once. It's really my favorite thing to watch from space. But we take a lot of pictures from space of places that Earth scientists are interested in. You can get satellite photography, but asking an astronaut to take a picture real time actually can provide a historical base. For example, this is a place called the Tongue of the Ocean in the Bahamas. And the different colors here represent different de depths and temperatures and salinity in the water. So this is something that, for example, somebody who is interested in coral reefs would be interested in this picture over time. This is another favorite picture of mine. It's, uh, I, I like to call it my astronaut training photo because, well, let's put it this way. When you look out at the Earth from space, there's no convenient arrows saying north this way. So you can actually get confused. And north truly is at the bottom of this picture. So this is Mount Rainier looking out over the city of Seattle, Mount Adams, Mount Hood near Portland, obviously an extremely rare clear day in the Pacific Northwest. But this is a wonderful, wonderful shot of Mount St. Helens. So as, as we are able to take pictures like this for geologists and people who are studying how Mount St. Helens is coming back after the eruption in the 80s, wonderful opportunity. And we share these pictures publicly. And sometimes we just take pictures that we think interest us. I, I grabbed a hold of this picture, which is of Atlanta, taken by one of my fellow shuttle crew members. So I'm looking at it, and hopefully you know your way around. I was kind of like, where's Hartsfield? So I, just, I think it'd be easier if I was flying in a, in a T-38. We also take pictures of places that are much more familiar to us. And so we took a lot of pictures of Cape Cod on this flight just because uh, obviously I went to Wellesley and MIT and Dan went to MIT as well and then we had this other crew member who went to this other small local school in Boston as well. <laughs> so anyway, we had a lot of pictures of Boston and Cape Cod on this particular flight. Obviously Stephanie went to Harvard. <laughs> so I'm going to show you a video but I just wanted to tell a little bit of the story in the background of what you're going to see in the video about something that happened to us an adventure on STS-120. We launched successfully. We docked to the space station. That's the station there. That's the space shuttle. We got Node 2 out of the payload bay using the robot arm, got it attached. We detached P6, the solar array, from the top of the space station, moved it safely out to the end of the truss, and all in the course of three spacewalks that went very well. And at the end of the third spacewalk, from inside, Peggy and Dan and I began to deploy the solar array. First half went out fine. The second half, about two-thirds of the way through, I saw this in the camera. So I called for an abort. We floated over to the shuttle and got the binoculars out and were completely horrified at what we saw. So the solar array here was about two-thirds of the way deployed. And what was happened here was some of the uh, wires that helped guide it on the way out had gotten tarl snarled and tangled. There's actually two rips here. There's one here and then a really big one here. So the situation that we were in was extremely serious. It took a, a little time for everybody to figure out how serious it was. The problem with having the solar array only partly deployed like that was that it was very subject to the changes in the motion of the space station, but more importantly, as we fire the thrusters of the space shuttle, 
it causes dynamics throughout the whole space station, especially the solar arrays. So the concern was if we undocked, this rip might propagate. We also had a solar array that wasn't fully deployed. So it was kind of floppy out there with a big snarled bunch of tangled wires. Here's the real problem. You can't turn it off. You can't unplug it. So 120 volts of direct current, no way to unplug it. So it was completely activated the whole time. We'd never imagined a scenario like this. It was not designed to be repaired from a spacewalk. We didn't even know how to get a crew member out there. We have a rule. We don't send a spacewalker more than 30 minutes away from the airlock because that's how long their suit could support a leak. So we don't want to send them any further, and we had no way to get out there. However, if we jettisoned the solar array for safety, we would not have enough electrical power for the Japanese and the European laboratories, which were already loaded on shuttles and ready to launch. So the future of the space station was at risk. We had to come up with something. And it was the ground that came up with a solution to stitch up the solar arrays using these cufflinks. We called them cufflinks because they had kind of a flipper bar on the end. When you slid them through, they locked into place, just like a cufflink will. So it was very much of an Apollo 13 moment. What do they have on the space station? What do they have on the space shuttle? We used just about every piece, every roll of Kapton tape, which is insulating tape, that we had on both vehicles. It took about three days to build and construct it. Here's George and Peggy actually building the cufflinks. The guys on the ground figured out how you would install it and how it would work. We also had to figure out how to get a spacewalker out there. The space station arm would not reach out there. So in the end, we came up with a solution. The ground came up with it, and we implemented it, which was to use the space station robot arm, but use that boom that belonged to the space shuttle with the camera on the end of it, and put a spacewalker on it and get out there. Now, there were a lot of serious issues with this. We weren't actually even 100% that Scott could reach. So we put Scott out there. We put wheels at the base of the solar array to keep an eye on him. You can see Scott out there working on the cufflinks. So the very first cufflink, Scott was not allowed to touch the solar array, or he could be electrocuted. So he had to use Kapton insulated tools. So he couldn't touch it, so he could use one tool to bring it towards him, and then he could push the cufflink in. And he had another tool that we called the hockey stick, which was like about this long, and it looked like a hockey stick covered with Kapton tape, and that's what he had to keep the solar array away from him. So he had three things going and only two hands to do it with. Well, the first time he went to put the cufflink in, something happened that no one had anticipated. When he shoved it in the hole, the laws of physics came into play, and as he pushed, the solar array began to ripple, and a sinusoidal wave went all the way down to the bottom of the solar array, and it started to come back up to Scott. And Wheels was the only person who could see it. I had the binoculars. I was looking straight on. I saw some motion. But Wheels was at the base of the solar array, so he was the only person who could see the ripples coming at Scott. And he said, Scott, look out. So Scott took his hockey stick, held it out, leaned as far back as he could. Wheels said it scared him to death because as the ripple came up, at one point he completely lost sight of Scott. So we didn't know. None of us knew if Scott had been touched or not until Scott said, OK, it's passed. And then the dynamics slowly settled down. And it's amazing what you can get used to, because after the hearts came out of our mouths, Scott kept going. And every time he put a cufflink in and he stitched it, the same thing would happen. And he just stopped and leaned back and waited for it to go past him. So. It was, it was a pretty impressive performance. He really is uh, an amazing guy, able to keep his cool. But it was interesting to see how this teamwork developed, because no one knew what it was going to take to do this. No one told Wheels, hey, keep an eye on, on Scott and make sure that everything is OK. He was sort of keeping an eye on the robot arm. He had no idea that this was going to happen. So it was interesting to see those dynamics as, as things went on, how it developed. 
And I'm happy to say that the completion was we were able to fully deploy the solar array. I can see where their little wrinkle is. I know right where it is, where the stitches are. We were able to deploy the solar array, and the space station is now producing power. The Japanese and the European laboratories are there. We obviously safely undocked. So now I'd like to shift gears for just a moment and talk about the students that are here with us tonight. This is NASA's vision for space exploration. I've talked a lot about the space station. It will be complete in about a year. This is how it looks uh, right now. So you can see all four, four solar arrays are there. Uh, the laboratories are set up. We have some additional living quarters and some other workplaces that we'd like to add. And once we have completed that and fully stocked the space station, we are going to retire the space shuttle. And what are we going to do next? Well, that's what I'm working on right now at Lockheed Martin. I left NASA so that I could work on designing a new lunar spacecraft called Orion. We are going to go back to the moon. We haven't been back to the moon since 1972. So the Constellation program has a rocket called Ares that lifts Orion, this lunar vehicle, and takes Altair, the lunar lander, down to the surface of the moon. Just recently, we had our first successful test of the Ares lo uh, launch rocket. And Orion, the spacecraft, is intended to go both to the space station and on to the moon. And we hope to actually start flying it to the space station around 2015. We're already engaged in testing it. You can see it looks a lot like Apollo, but it's bigger. It carries four people and 500 pounds of cargo at the same time. So we can do a lot more science, but bring science to the space station, but more importantly, bring more science to and from the moon. But here's the real prize, and that's Mars. I'd like to talk about the Mars program right now. I think people are very familiar with uh, these rovers, Phoenix, Spirit and Opportunity, the Mars Exploration Rovers that are out there, I like to, to talk to people about, gosh, you know, if you were a Martian, where would you send a rover on Earth? Would you send it to Antarctica? Would you send it to the Grand Canyon? Would you send it to the beach or to the mountains? How could you pick? There's so many places to pick from. Well, Mars is smaller than the Earth, but not that much smaller. We have the same problem. So we are sending these rovers to study the surface, to understand it better, and to choose the science. But the goal is to send a rover that is 10 times as big with one of the students in this room driving it. We're going to send people to Mars, we hope, in about 25 years, which means there's a student out there right now between the age of about 5 and 25 Someone in school today is going to be the first person to set foot on Mars. That person is born, is walking among us. Who will it be? And when I look out at a, at a room full like this, I am so excited that it might be one of you and that I will be back here in 25 years listening to you talk about your trip to Mars. How exciting would that be? So that's, that's really why I'm here. It's, it's why I want to talk to you about what we have going. The challenge of my generation of astronauts was to build the space station, but the challenge of your generation of astronauts and rocket scientists, and we need everyone, because going to Mars is not just about a rocket scientist or an astronaut. It's a whole generation. We need politicians. We need lawyers to help us understand how we're going to divide up the data. We need to work with other countries. We need to figure out how we're going to keep people safe and alive. We need to, people to figure out how we're going to feed people and farm in space. So it will be the challenge of this entire generation, and I want to challenge all the students in this room to be a part of that. So now that I've given my recruiting pitch, <laughs> I would very much like to take you to space with me. If we can start our home movie, that's what I call it, uh, our STS-120 home movie, because as an astronaut, you know, they give you all kinds of unusual training. You know, you learn how to be, uh, uh, you scuba dive, uh, drive a tank. But one of the things that I love most is they also taught us how to be photographers because we don't take professional photographers to space with us. So all the video that you see, you can go ahead and roll it, uh, is in space comes from our crew. We had to learn how to, mostly they just give us really expensive camera equipment and pray. So that's kind of how that works. <laughs> 
So we'll start with the walk out of the crew. I just love this shot. This is historical. That door, every astronaut at the Kennedy Space Center has walked out that door. Every shuttle crew has ridden that crew transport vehicle out. And I can tell you, riding out to the pad, it is an amazing experience to feel the weight of all those shuttle crews ahead and behind you. That was our first fist bump. You probably didn't see it. That was our crew. We do fist bumps followed by spirit fingers. So you'll see that several times throughout the, the video. Strapping in, getting ready for a launch. At T minus six seconds, the main engines ignite. And at T zero, the solid rocket boosters. We literally roll off the pad to get into the right inclination orbit to catch the space station. After about two minutes, the solid rocket boosters have expended their fuel and they separate pyrotechnically from the vehicle, leaving us on main engines only. You'll see the shuttle fly away down here in the lower right, still carrying the orange external tank. After eight and a half minutes, we have approached, we're in orbit, Main engines shut down and we separate from this orange external tank which then burns up in the atmosphere, unlike the solid rocket boosters which hit the water and are recovered and reused. First thing we do is open the payload bay doors of the shuttle to radiate the heat of our avionics into space. And then we check the shuttle over to make sure that we didn't take any damage on ascent. So this is a computer graphic showing the shuttle robot arm using the boom with the camera on the end taking a look at the leading edge of the wings and the nose cap. It's a little hard to see because it's dark, but that's me waving at mission control as the camera goes by. They appreciated that. It's a, it's a long, slow day looking at the vehicle. On flight day three, it's all about docking to the space station. That's what the shuttle engines look like from the International Space Station as we fire our thrusters to gradually catch up with the space station. Now, a lot of this is computer controlled, but I used this optical alignment site for the last 2,000 feet approach as we get to the space station. So it's all manual flying within 2,000 feet. At 600 feet, I stopped and put the shuttle into a backflip so that the space station crew members could take pictures, not only of the nose, but also of the belly of the vehicle. Once again, just to stop and check and make sure that we took no damage on ascent. So it requires the entire crew to work together to dock to the space station. It's not just one person flying. Everybody plays a role. We have to measure our closure rate very carefully and our alignment. And in fact, I'm looking at a camera, not really even looking out the window. I'm looking at a camera. So if you're good at video games, you're good at, you'd probably be good at this. So. Fist bump. <laughs> Based on naval ship tradition, the space station has a ship's bell, which was commissioned especially for the station. They ring it whenever we arrive and depart on the space shuttle. This is so exciting. It doesn't seem like it to you guys, but when we see our friends that we haven't seen in months that have been living aboard the space station, it's very emotional for all of us. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of time to enjoy it. Peggy took us on a quick tour, gave us our safety briefing, and then we had to get ready for our first task, which was to install Node 2, Harmony. So that required, maybe if we could bring the lights down here a little bit so that everybody can see the video better, that'd be great. Here's the spacewalkers getting ready to go outside. And then over here you see the robotic arm preparing for activity. Actually, the first job of the robotic arm, as uh, Wheels and Scott came out the door of the airlock, was actually Wheels jumped onto the footstool at the end of the robot arm and took the ride of a lifetime. 
So he's moving out over the sill, looking out at the Earth 250 miles below. So at the same time, those guys are doing their tasks to get ready for node 2. The robotic arm operators grappled node 2. This is all sped up, of course, because it takes a long time. You move very, very slowly and carefully with the robot arm. They lifted node 2 out of the payload bay, slid it over the sill, flipped it around, and slid it into position. And then through a laptop computer, they operated a sense, set of latches and bolts to mechanically attach node 2 to the space station. At the same time, our spacewalkers then go out and finish all the fluid connectors. That would be for cooling, power, and data. This was also one of the best things about this is after we got node 2 attached, I mean, it even smelled like a new car inside. It was all clean and beautiful. There was no baggage piled anywhere in it. So we were so excited to go in and play around in there. It was a great place for doing backflips, just awesome. So we had to get ready for the next walk, which was all about detaching P6, that solar array, and moving it out into position. So that, was, that consumed the entire spacewalk because the only way to detach it was by the spacewalkers doing it. So the first they had to do all the connections first to detach it, and then they used the biggest cordless drill you have ever seen in your life to detach it physically. And so you can see there's actually space. This is P6 here, and this is the space station. You can see space between it. But it was pretty tight quarters for the robot arm. You see how close it was to this antenna. So the spacewalkers had to stay there and guide the robot arm operators as they pulled P6 away from the top of the space station. Then we handed it off to the shuttle arm and left it out overnight. At the same time, we had some other maintenance tasks to do and discovered a problem with the solar array rotary joint, which later took 16 months to fix in many spacewalks. So it was the first time we'd seen that. There are many other little dog and cat tasks that the spacewalkers do out there. They attached an extra grapple fixture and so forth. So the third EVA was planned to attach the solar array. That's the only purpose for that entire spacewalk. So the robot arm specialists got P6 all the way out the end of the truss. This is the limiting case for the design of the space station got it into position, and then the spacewalkers climbed all the way out on the truss, and then they actually guided the robot arm operators, saying a centimeter to the left, a little bit of an angle difference to guide it to make it perfectly aligned. And then once they got the two perfectly aligned, then the spacewalkers used their drill once again to attach the pieces. You can see how far away, this is the shuttle way out there, it's over 100 feet out at the end of the truss. So they are a long way from safety all the way out there. Wheels got his second ride of a lifetime on the end of the robot arm. They're carrying a piece of spare equipment to the space station. And as Wheels and Scott were coming back in the airlock, Peggy and Dan and I began to deploy the solar arrays. And the first one went perfectly. Uh, we were pretty pleased about that. But then when we got to the second one, the angle of the sun was very difficult. You can see a lot of twinkling and bright stars here. And we had a little, lot of difficulty seeing it. We got about 2 thirds of the way out. And as I mentioned, I saw this, called for an abort, um, took, kind of took a deep breath and, and said, what the heck are we going to do about this? So this three-day activity was very intense to figure out how to build the cufflinks. So Peggy and George set up a workshop inside Node 2 and built those cufflinks. At the same time, we had to prepare the spacewalkers and we had to get ready with the robot arm. Finally, our fourth EVA dawned. We didn't really have any idea how this day was going to go, but one of the things we did was we took this capped on tape and wrapped every metal part of Scott's suit just in case he accidentally touched the solar array. And as you can see, all of his tools are either wrapped with white or gold insulating tape. This was an incredibly long ride out there. Scott was 45 minutes away from the airlock when he was finally out there, which made us pretty nervous because if he had a problem with his spacesuit, we weren't sure we could get him safely back inside. This is the view that he saw from his helmet camera. You could see the entire belly of the shuttle. He could see the whole space station. He was a long way away. 
It was a very challenging robotics task because it was the outboard solar array. So Stephanie and Dan had to thread the needle and not touch the inboard solar array. Get Scott, you can see his, his shadow there on the solar array, a view out of Wheels' helmet camera with Scott all the way up there. The first thing he did was to snip, snip, and cut that snarl away. And then here goes the first cuff link as he's sliding it through that hole. We're beginning to see the one that was really, that kind of really caught it, and he wasn't really expecting when he tugged on it to start to see these dynamics begin to build. And then they began to get worse and worse as he pushed harder. So you can see he's got the hockey stick in one hand, he's got the tool to pull it to him, and he's trying to sh shove the cuff link in at the same time. So he has three things going on with his hands at once. Scott is really tall and has long arms. I'm not sure anybody else in the astronaut office could have done this. Uh, I also like to tease him that uh, he was an emergency medical doctor, so stitching came naturally to him. <laughs> he finally got all the stitches put in, and then we backed him away and very, very gingerly, just one bay at a time, opened up the, the uh, solar array. You can see that if you mismeasured the length as we constructed those cuff links, if it was too short, you couldn't get it fully extended. If they were too long, it would still be floppy. We had to get it right within an eighth of an inch. Thank goodness we did. And we fully deployed the solar array, and these guys are starting the long trek back in. I love this video out of Scott's helmet camera. You can see, see his hands and how gracefully he moves. He's just pushing himself along with his hands. Your legs are totally useless in space. They really are, except to hold things between your knees. Your hands become your feet, and your knees become your hands. Once we had finished that, we had a little time for fun. We talked to uh, the president of Italy, so that was interesting and especially exciting for Paolo. Uh, former President Bush and Barbara Bush <laughs> came in. We visited with them for a little while. That was really nice. This is a tour of the space station. This is the closet of the space station. I think everybody has a closet like this where everything doesn't quite fit. So this is the laboratory, Destiny Laboratory, the U.S. lab. There are experiments on the floor, the walls, and the ceilings because, of course, in microgravity you can access the entire space. It makes living there very different because just because something is on the ceiling doesn't mean that it's inaccessible. We also had our own science experiments, Paolo doing a neurological experiment here. He also made some ham radio contacts with some students in Italy who had designed experiments for us to carry aboard the space shuttle. So this was a huge event for Italy. It's important to talk about with the space station, we have 23 other partners and this is a joint venture worldwide. Of course, beneath us is rolling the most stunning backdrop you could ever imagine, the earth passing below us. These are some wildfires in Southern California that were happening at the time that we were on orbit. So it was a unique opportunity to take some pictures and once again downlink them to earth scientists to try to understand what was happening and to gauge the scope. We also just take pictures of places we love, like I mentioned Cape Cod. This is the Po Valley of Italy, and those are the Italian Alps. We took a lot of pictures of Italy. <laughs> and Scott knew that he was planning on climbing Mount Everest, which he did successfully last year, so we got a lot of the Himalayas as well. This is a tradition. After a mission is successful, the two commanders mount the patch on the space station and then began the farewell ceremony. Now, I, I got to tell you, this was really hard. We had to leave Dan behind. We'd been training with him for 14 months. And Clay was leaving his home of five months behind. So my marine test pilot, pilot kept saying, this is just a really moist event. <laughs> so everybody was just crying their eyes out by the time we got to our last fist bump and spirit fingers. So this is the opportunity for George, as a rookie pilot, to fly the space shuttle. Tossed him the keys and said, back her out. And that's exactly what he did. He undocked us from the space station. Once again, you see the whole team supporting him, giving him range and range rate measurements as he backs away. Ship's bell saying farewell from the International Space Station. George then fired the thrusters. You can see him on the controls here. 
that pushed us away from the space station and began a long, lazy arc, a loop-de-loop -loop around the space station. We do that for a couple reasons. We take pictures for maintenance purposes, but the other thing is documentation. As we build the space station on each and every mission, it looks different. You can actually see it looks different mission to mission. So this is documenting just a moment in history, the way the space station looked in the middle of its assembly. It's a wonderful thing to be a part of such a wonderful laboratory in space. So after we undocked, uh, we began to prepare to come home. Now the shuttle is the world's biggest glider. We have no rocket engines that will work in the Earth's atmosphere after launch, and we have no rocket fuel for them, only orbital engines. So getting into our launch and entry pressure suits and preparing for that final deorbit burn requires the entire crew to come together to convert our spacecraft into an, a plane, basically. So firing the engines, you can see all the bags moving and big jolt. It's, it feels like a lot of force after days and days in microgravity. Slowing down as we plow through the Earth's atmosphere, making turns to dump energy and to dump lift. We only have one chance to make the runway. We do the deorbit burn over the Indian Ocean. And even though the runway at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida is 15,000 feet long, it looks pretty small from the Indian Ocean. The shuttle is the largest supersonic aircraft, so you can actually hear both the leading and the trailing edge shock waves. It's a very distinctive and unique double boom. Coming in an absolutely gorgeous day in Florida, the shuttle flies like a large brick. <laughs> it's uh, got some interesting handling qualities as well. So about 2,000 feet, uh, we uh, arm the gear, and I begin to haul back on the stick and adjust the sink rate. We're still going about one and, a, one and a half times as fast as an airliner, so we deploy a drag chute to help slow us down on the runway. So an absolutely extraordinary vehicle that is a rocket ship, it's an orbiting laboratory. It can dock to the space station. You can do science aboard it. You can bring science up. You can bring science back. It was our home. We lived there. It was our pup tent in space. And then it brought us home on a runway like an aircraft. I'll be really sad when the shuttle retires at the end of next year because we're not going to see another spacecraft like this for a long time. An extraordinary vehicle and an extraordinary trip. Well, that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, come on. Guys, sit down. Hey, thank you. Thank you. But you know what? We have time for question and answer, and that's a much better use of our time. So I know I didn't tell you I could give three talks like this. I'd love to talk about living in space, and I'd love to talk about the leadership aspects of bringing a crew together to do something so dangerous, and there's so much to tell you. So I know I didn't cover everything. I'd like to hear from the future astronauts, especially. Uh, what they thought of their first training video. So, anybody have any questions? You have any questions? Yes. Um, I didn't see you with the uh, blush and your beautiful hair. Or the heat. <laughs> uh, we are, what do you do up there? Yeah, we, uh, could we switch back to the slides? Because I, I do have a slide that I could show you. So, I'll have to kind of run through to see them if I can find them. Food, food, here's food. There we go. So um, we don't, don't, yes, it actually, this is, <laughs> don't try this at home. So <laughs> it's, it's pretty dangerous. So actually, really, one of the things that I enjoy talking about the most is living in space, because I think it, it's something that everybody connects with. Um, but also, the engineering problems of living in space, but also the personal problems. It's actually a, a really big deal. So I hate to tell you kids, but everything that your mom tells you is absolutely critical to being an astronaut, like keeping track of your stuff, 
Chewing with your mouth closed? Yeah, really big deal. So when you're living together in these quarters, oh yeah, trust me. So yeah, things float away. So it can be fun and the temptation is very strong to play with your food. So it is very strong, but you can have terrible accidents. There are commanders who forbid yellow or red drinks on orbit, just forbid them. So we have fruit drinks, you know, you can have lemonade, you can have orange juice, you can have cherry punch and that kind of stuff. Actually, I found that lemonade and uh, orange juice come out pretty, pretty easily, um, but you know it's the day that everybody is wearing their crew matching shirt because you're going to have a big press conference on orbit and someone lets go a big glob of, you know, cherry whatever or grape juice and it's like right on all over their shirt. Because the problem is with a little ball floating away, everybody's like, oh, that's so pretty. Look at it. Because in the absence of gravity, the most important force is surface tension. So the water will be this perfect sphere and it's gorgeous. It's really fun watching it float along. And you kind of forget that when it hits something, it's wet and it's going to make a big mess. So we, we have a lot of challenges. That's one of the things that we do with our rookies. It's very hard to teach them on the ground. So you have to kind of wait till day two. And that's when you have the talk, you know, the talk about how to keep the bathroom clean. Yeah, how to keep track of your stuff and not let it float away and how to take care of your food. So th that's a big issue for us. It's always fun to get a picture like this because you can actually get a sense of the things that you could do. But this was carefully staged. So the other thing, we talked about personal hygiene. Um, there's a picture of Paolo washing his hair. And this is what my hair looks like on orbit normally. But you know, you have to be careful with this because it gets in people's faces. And it can, you can actually, I had a terrible accident with a circuit breaker panel. <laughs> it's like, oh, you know, and so I actually had to pop a circuit breaker to get my hair out of it. So you have to be really, really careful. And you only see pictures like this when people are washing their hair and cleaning up just because you have to be considerate of everybody. So that's, that's one of the reasons why we go on that camping trip is to actually practice talking to each other about issues like this because you, the last thing you want when your lives are at risk is to get into an argument about how the food is prepared or who left their stuff out or lost something critical, which happens a lot in space because things float away. So, but it's a great question. I, I, I'd love to talk about it more. Yes. Thank you again for, for speaking and being such a great role model for all the students Thank here you. this evening. I have a question going forward. All of the experience that you've had in space and in your training, let's say you went to a desert island and there was only one item that you could take with you. What would it be? Yeah, actually, there's a, somebody said duct tape, and I'm like, yeah, that's pretty high on the list. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Nobody's ever asked me that before. But actually, the thing that I found most useful was um, my Leatherman. You know, the, the tool thing, it's like a Swiss Army knife, but it's got like 82 functions, you know, that kind of stuff. That is just indispensable. So I had a little fanny pack, and I've learned after three times in space what to carry in it. And I have duct tape wrapped on a stick. So they take a popsicle stick and wrap duct tape, a big wad of it so that it's there, you can pull it out and take, take a piece off anytime you want it. And I kept a leather man in there. So I would probably do that. So but it's a good question. Nobody's ever asked me. But usually, that, that's what I, I felt like I needed most every day. A lot of maintenance kind of stuff. Yes. Yes. You. What was the most fun thing you've ever done in space? <laughs> oh. The most fun thing I've ever done in space? Probably dance. So I, I really... I, to study gymnastics and dance. And so as a kind of a personal thing, just wanted to see what it would be like. I mean, stop and think about it. How weird is that? How are you gonna have a theater in microgravity? Do you have it a 360 theater or maybe the audience is like 2D and this kind of thing? But like a stage like this would be horrible because you just float away and you couldn't grab onto anything. The space station is, is is big enough that someone my size can get stranded in the middle. You know, I can, you know, and you can't, can't hold on to anything, and they do that to you when you're a rookie. 
You know, they, they, they get you in the middle and then they, they float away and you're stuck and you're swimming and you can't get out. So you have to have things to hold on to. So I wanted to practice and see what it was like. So I did um, Chenet turns, which are a ballet move where you snap and go around. And what I found, I should have understood this as a physics major, is that I precessed. So as I, as I did my snap turns, I began a slow procession to go with it. So I think for me personally, the most fun thing I ever did was practice dancing in space. Because I'd never seen anybody else do it and I had a lot of fun doing it. Yes? How big was exactly the robotic arm? How big is the robotic arm? Well, the, the uh, space shuttle robotic arm is about, it's about, I think it's about 80 feet, 75, 80 feet long. And the space station one is longer. I'm trying to remember the statistics right now. I think it's closer to like 130, but that's uh, uh, one leg of it. So when it's fully extended, yeah, maybe 130 is fully extended, actually, now that I think about it. It's, it is definitely longer. I, I'm sorry, but I know you can find the number on the internet. I don't, don't remember it off the top of my head. It was long enough to reach. That's what mattered. So uh, yes. Yes, right, right there in the red striped shirt. Oh, good question. You know, I was an astronomy major. So I was really excited about seeing stars in space. Well, it turns out that during the daytime, there is enough reflected light from the Earth's atmosphere, it's actually hard to see stars. So we're only about 250 miles up, and the Earth is very bright. The atmosphere is very intense, almost an electric blue. So it, it kind of fades out the stars. So I waited until night, and I got in the window and waited for my favorite constellation, Orion. And as I watched it go by, I thought, there's something wrong. Couldn't put my finger on it. What was wrong with this picture? And then I realized that the stars weren't twinkling, because they twinkle because of the Earth's atmosphere. It's like the atmosphere acts almost like a lens. So it obscures it a little bit, and so that's why the stars twinkle. And you know what bothered me about it is that it looked like I was in a planetarium. You ever been in a planetarium where the stars didn't twinkle? It just looked kind of funny to me that, that they weren't twinkling. And then, though, I began to really appreciate one thing as an astronomer. You wait for the one thing you're observing to slowly rise in the sky until it's at a good spot to point your telescope at. You want it minimum amount of atmosphere, so you want it straight over top. So astronomers are used to huddling, shivering in the cold, waiting for their star or object to reach the zenith. Well, in space, when you go around the Earth every, 45, uh, every 90 minutes, you watch the entire sky go by in 45 minutes. You get to watch the whole thing happen and unfold, all your favorite constellations marching by in just 45 minutes. I really like that part. I think I'd like to do astronomy from space. So let's see, who do we, yes? Um, I want to be an astronaut too. What do you suggest that I do? So I I'll tell you what I, I tell people who ask me about being an astronaut. It's a very, very good question because I think uh, you won't go wrong. Uh, anything you want to do uh, with some of these thoughts behind you. The first thing you have to do is to be good at something. So our approach in the astronaut office is we pick people who are good at different things. So we don't have all test pilots. We don't have all engineers. We don't have all geologists or doctors or mathematicians or computer scientists or astronomers. But we have a little bit of everything. So the theory is that when you're facing the unknown and you have no idea what's going to happen, someone Someone, somewhere, is going to be able to make a connection based off their past history. So we want diversity. We want people who have different backgrounds. The only thing that unites us is that this is fairly technical work. You can see that. So everybody has to have a good grounding in math, science, or engineering. So anything you want to do, you should major in whatever interests you. Because you don't graduate from college and go to astronaut school. All of us were something else before we became astronauts. The average age to be hired is in the middle 30s. So you have to go do something first. It better be something you really like, because that's a long time to do it, and then you'll be better at it. So you want to be good at that. So study anything you want related to a technical field and be really, really good at it. But the other piece of it is to think about who you would want to live on board the space station with for six months, or 
take a two-year trip to Mars with. So I tell people, think about what it means. The people in your class, the people you know that you like to spend the most time with, that you feel like you might actually trust your life to them, that you'd like to be a part of a team with them because they're good team players, and practice becoming that person. That's the best advice I can give you because that's actually much harder. It really is. So let's see. Um, there's a student right here in a white shirt. Yes. <laughs> um, do I have any pictures? I don't think I have any pictures of my drinks floating around. I do have some video. I have more video than you, you could shake a stick at back at home, but I have to pick what part I'm bringing with me, but so not on this trip, sorry. So let's see, do we have a question over there? Have you ever had a person under 30 go on a spaceship? Have we ever had a person under 30 go on a spaceship? Not yet, we have picked a couple people under the age of 30, um, a couple of real fast burners that got a PhD uh, pretty young and, and moved on. Uh, very quickly, but typically it takes at least a few years of training before you fly the first time. And I'm trying to remember what the youngest somebody's been, I think it was my classmate, Ed Liu, and he was like 32 when he flew on his first flight. So, let's see. How about all the way in the back? You mean the space station? Yeah, I do. I've got, um, no, I think that was, I might need to, hold on a second. Let me go back. I think it was all the way at the beginning. I think you may have met Orion. Oh, Orion. Orion. Oh, yeah. Let's go look at Orion. Let's see. Um, what am I looking for? View. What I'm working on now. Here we go. Actually, this is not a bad picture to start with. It's, uh, figure out how, there we go. So, what we're looking at here, it's called Constellation. Aries is the booster, it's the rocket. So Ares 1 is a smaller rocket that only goes to the, can lift you to the space station. Ares 5 is a heavy lift vehicle that can actually uh, boost you to the moon. So if you're going to go to the moon, you've got an Earth departure stage, and there's, that's Orion right there. So there's Orion. It's the capsule. It's got solar arrays. And this is the lunar lander. So if you're going to go all the way to the moon, you're going to take the whole package into lo uh, lunar orbit, and then the lunar lander will separate and go down to the surface while Orion orbits. And then part of it will lift back up and bring you back to Orion to bring you back to the Earth's atmosphere. Does that help answer the question? OK, we've got a question over there. Is that Sarah? Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, how long would it take for a shuttle to get from Earth to Mars? Who? How long would it take a shuttle to get from the Earth to Mars? We don't carry enough gas to even get to the moon. So the space shuttle stays in low Earth orbit, about 250 miles up. So the problem is, it would really be nice to keep flying the shuttle. It would be really exciting to take the shuttle to the moon. But right now, we don't have a rocket that is powerful enough to lift something as heavy as the space shuttle all the way to the moon. Our experience during uh, Apollo, and it will be about the same for Orion as well, is that it's eight and a half minutes for the shuttle to get into space, into 50 miles up, two and a half to three days to get to the moon. Anybody have any clue how long it's going to take to get us to Mars? I think I mentioned it earlier. How long? Two years. Two, two years total, round trip. Six months there a year until the alignment is good to come home. If you're not going at the best possible orbital alignment, it'll be a nine-month trip. Now, one of my colleagues, uh, Franklin Chang Diaz, who is uh, from Costa Rica, is, has actually invented a plasma engine that we think could get us to Mars in two months, which would really help solve a lot of our problems. So it would be interesting. But I would encourage the students in the audience to consider growing up and designing an even faster rocket. So, how are we doing? Let's see. 
Right here, you've been waiting for a while. Um, what would we do if some liquid got onto the control? If some what? Um, liquid got onto the control. Ooh, bad, bad. Liquid, what happens if liquid gets on the controls? You know, it's a funny thing about being a space shuttle commander. It is a lot like being a mom. <laughs> so, which is the wrath of mom will come down on you if you make a mess. So we actually have ways around it. Each one of our controls has three contacts. So in case you get a short, it's very rare that all three will short out. But at the same time, our specific controls, especially for landing, we keep covered all the time with a little box that's wrapped around it and Velcroed down just to make sure it's more in case you kick it, but it's also to make sure that we don't get anything in the way. It's one of those little solutions that you come up with, you know, that you might not think of, but then you realize, you know, this is probably a smart thing to do. So, uh, yes, right here. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's horrible. <laughs> so the question is about landing. So uh, landing the space shuttle is a little bit like landing an airplane. So I've landed a lot of airplanes. Um, and so that's one reason why they hire test pilots is so that you can adjust quickly because, you know, the reality is the first time you land it is the first time you've ever landed it. You know, it's not like you, you know, you, you watch someone else do it as a pilot, watch someone else do it, but actually having your hands on the stick you don't really have practice for that. W what we do is we have a Gulf Stream that we've modified to fly like the shuttle on half of it. So you climb into this Gulf Stream, you climb up to about 35,000 feet, they throw a computer switch, there's the Gulf Stream pilot in the right seat, you're in the left seat, and then it flies like the space shuttle until you get down to about a simulated touchdown. And then when that happens, it kicks back over to the Gulf Stream, and the Gulf Stream pilot climbs you back up and you practice over and over again. That's as close as we can get. We also have simulator practice. The nice thing about the Gulf Stream is that it allows us to actually fly in real weather and wind conditions at the Cape where you're really going to land. But uh, when you come back in, you are not feeling good. Gravity is not fun after taking a vacation in space because your whole body takes a vacation it's easier everything is easier and more comfortable your heart doesn't have to work as hard your muscles don't and so that gravity weighing down on you is very uncomfortable so you're making the most important landing of your life on national television feeling oh about 50 percent so it's yeah it's interesting how do the individuals that live on these space station stay physically fit and exercise while they're living there for several months? I'm sorry, I say it's it's okay. Um, I was asking how the individuals who live on the space station stay physically fit and exercise while they're living there for several right. months. Great, great question. Yeah, talking about staying fit on the space station. Right now, this is probably our biggest area of concern. We don't let anybody stay on the space station longer than six months because uh, there's only been one person in the world who stayed in space for longer than that, a Russian. And um, he's had some health issues, and we don't really know if it's because of his long-term stay in space or not, but we're not willing to take a chance. So six months is the maximum duration, whatever it takes to get you home within six months. And during that six months, we, we have seen a lot of issues with bone density loss is, is probably the biggest area of concern. You have a lot of muscle loss as well. So we have two forms of exercise. One is uh, cardio, basically. We have a treadmill, which is kind of interesting in microgravity because they have to strap you to it. Otherwise, as soon as you started to run, you'd shoot right off to the ceiling. So you're kind of strapped down to this thing. But of course, every time you take a step, you're actually floating. So it's not really a hardcore cardio workout. And, and so, but you know, you do get your heart rate up a little bit and it helps you with some of the, the motion dynamics of moving your head around and feeling accelerations. And then we have a resistive ex exercise device or RED that uh, has, it looks like football shoulder pads that you strap on and it's got cords that go to it and then, and then handles uh, for your hands too. And so you kind of do squats and you press up, you pull up the shoulder pads and that works your lower body and then handles, which you can do from any orientation in microgravity to work your upper body. And what we found actually is if people consistently do one hour of resistive exercise a day, 
um, they are coming back with zero bone density loss. So that's a really big thing. Now the other part, uh, people are pretty tottery and most, mostly can't climb, walk off the spacecraft themselves after landing from six months in space, which is a big worry because who's going to do it for us when we go to Mars, right? No astronauts and flight surgeons there for that. So, yes. Yeah, how do you sleep without drifting away? We well, saw one of the pictures I think we had. Let's see if I can get back to a nice crew picture here sleeping. Uh, no, living. Did I? Yeah, lower corner there. That's about. Not. So we have sleeping bags. Um, what we found is that most people really like to be strapped down, they like to feel something against their back. There are a few people, about 10, 20% of the astronaut office can sleep like bats, you know, with just a hook at the top and at the bottom so you don't float away in your sleep. I am definitely not one of those. Most of us really, really struggle for the first couple of weeks because it's a very uncomfortable feeling. We have, um, what you see here is actually uh, my pillow. So your, what, what the heck purpose is a pillow in space? Well, it turns out we're all a little more psychologically comfortable with a pillow, but it's going to float away. So it's got a little strap that goes across your forehead. <laughs> so that's what you see on, on my forehead right there. This is what your body naturally does in microgravity. You, your position is, is something like this. It's the lowest energy state when you're in that position. So it's kind of interesting. You can, you can put your arms into your sleeping bags uh, but it's a little warmer that way, and so it's kind of fun to get up actually in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom or something. It's like, you know, everybody looks like a zombie <laughs> floating, floating around. So it's actually fairly challenging, but once you get used to it and adjust, the folks who've been on space stations say that it's wonderful and you get like the best sleep ever because it's like being on a feather mattress or an air mattress. Yeah. Um, so I remember you. You're talking about uh, engines, um, so what do you think of solar sails? Yeah, solar sails are great. They're just really slow. Uh, it takes a long time to accelerate out to the speed. I think it would work really well. There's been a lot of great science fiction books written about the theory about that and how you would live with it. But that's, that's uh, it, it's really interesting technology. It's just not very well developed yet. So, but I think it's a very elegant solution. Let's see, do we have somebody in the back? Yes. What was your scariest time in space? What was my scariest time in space? I think all three of my missions have had something that scared me, and that's really normal. Um, you may not see it very often. Every mission has something that makes you scared. Usually it's that the mission isn't going to go well. You don't usually spend a lot of time. I think it's a little scary walking out and strapping in. Not the first time. The first time you're like, go, oh, yeah, yeah. And the second time you're like, you know, that was, uh, that was really interesting. So <laughs> you, you kind of realize what you've gotten yourself into after you launch on the space shuttle the first time. But I think on orbit, what we tend to worry about is disappointing the ground, disappointing um, our crewmates, not do, making a mistake. So you spend a lot of time worrying about that. But on my first mission, we had an electrical short um, that we thought we were going to have to come home and not deliver the two pieces of the space station we brought up. I was, and, and, then, and then I had to rewire the space shuttle. So I was a little scared then, especially when I turned the power switch back on. So I was talking to the ground and I said, I've checked it like 32 times. <laughs> and they were laughing at me. They're like, it's fine, turn it on. And it, and it worked. But for me, there is no question on this mission. It was watching Scott out there because the ground couldn't see him. They had cameras, but they're not really there. And so his life was my responsibility as the commander. That's the job of the commander, is to keep the crew safe and execute the mission. So I'm floating in the window with the binoculars, watching every move that he made, and hoping that I was making the right decision by letting him continue. And there is no question that was the hardest part about that mission for me. And in fact, at the end of the spacewalk, or at the end of the deploy, um, my team started going, yeah, Scott, Stephanie, awesome, great job. And I'm like, not until he's inside. <laughs>
Okay? When he's inside, then we can all celebrate, but let's get Scott back in the door, because he was a long way away. So, over here. What did we eat in space? Is that what the question was? Well, let me ask you a question. Do you, does it look to you like there's room for a refrigerator on the space shuttle? Mm, probably not. Pretty heavy. Takes a lot of power. So we do have a little tiny refrigerator on the space station. That was very exciting. Every once in a while we do fly one on the space shuttle if we have a medical experiment where we have um, like blood or urine samples that we're bringing home from a medical experiment that need to be kept pristine. So when we launch, we fill it with Bluebell ice cream. <laughs> but everybody has to eat it really fast because once you start the samples, then, then so you can't, can't have too much. So that's always wonderful. But generally, we don't have room for that. And so when you're staying on the space station or the space shuttle for a long period of time, how do you keep your food fresh? Any ideas, kids? How would you keep your, how do you make sure it doesn't spoil and go bad? So you got an idea? You could freeze it, but if you don't have a refrigerator, when it thaws, it goes nasty, right? Freeze dry it. Okay, there you go. Freeze dry it. Any other ideas? Put it into a pouch, airtight seal, right? Kind of like the soldiers use, meals ready to eat, MREs. So you got another idea? Just eat it, eat it, <laughs> eat it. Well, actually, kind of we use a combination of all of those things. The, the space shuttle is very, very nice because it has tons of water. And the reason why it has tons of water is because we use fuel cells to provide our electricity. You might notice when you look at the space shuttle, it doesn't have a solar array like the space station does. We have three fuel cells that combine liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen to generate electricity, and the byproduct is water. So we have lots and lots of water. We also use the water for cooling, so that's a part of, of the purpose of it. But it means we have lots of water to rehydrate our food with. So that is probably about two-thirds of our food is freeze-dried, and so then you can rehydrate it it's in these little packages like this, uh, kind of a small size. It's got a little plastic end to it with a, a foil cover. So our, we have a water tank with like a needle with a hole in the end of it that comes out of it. So you slide that on the needle. It punctures the tin foil and it gets down into this. And then it's got a recipe on it. This one says 50 milliliters hot water, three to five minutes. It's a chicken patty. So <laughs> after three to five minutes now, Usually, they take a lot longer than they say. So if it's hot food, we put it in a little oven that will keep it warm while it's rehydrating, because otherwise the hot water will cool off. So we have a lot of food that's freeze-dried like that, but we do have MREs, meals ready to eat. They're typically irradiated, which is how you can make sure there's no bacteria growing inside there. So that's, that's very popular as well. And then there are some things that just actually do pretty well um, for example, dried fruit. So all you do is you have to seal it and you're done, pretty much. Now this has a, a much more limited shelf life, but the best is the nuts and the candies, because you know they float, so you can kind of shoot them back and forth to each other and play stupid astronaut games with them. So anyway, how are we doing on time? We're, we're about time. Okay. I think nuts right. and candies is a great transition, <laughs> don't you? We'll take one more one question. More question. This poor lady hasn't had anything to eat yet, and oh, I've got to yeah. remember that she needs dinner. She remember she has to so eat three times. So we have one back. more question over here. Um, earlier, you were mentioning with the Mars mission that if you were even a little bit off, it would take nine months to get back to Earth. Yeah. Um, would the shuttles, like the Orion, be able to support the crew for that extra period of time? Uh, would they be able to like have that much more weight on the shuttle and still be able to function properly? Well, the shuttle can't make it to the moon or Mars. So Orion can go to the moon, but is not yet designed for Mars. We're hoping to use the moon as a, sort of a test ground. We can practice. It's only a couple of days away. So before you send a crew six months away from help, you need to make sure that you're really confident of all the technology that you're using. But this is probably the biggest debate that is raging in the Mars world right now, which is what is the right architecture for getting a person there? 
Do you uh, launch in pieces and assemble a big spacecraft with all the capability, with you know, propellant, food, all those other things? Because actually, we know a little bit about assembling spacecraft now. We've learned a lot from building the space station. Maybe you could use the space station as sort of a dry dock to send people out on spacewalks and use the robot arm to, to build it. Well, so then you need to attach a motor to it. A lot of times propellant doesn't last very long in space. It boils off. So do you attach that last and then boost out? So now you have this giant vehicle that can sustain six, ten people, however many you pick, on a six-month trip there and then six months back. Now how are you going to get down to the surface? Do you really want to take this giant vehicle and bring it down? You probably want a lander like we're talking about doing for the moon. But then how much do you take down and bring back up and how is it going to get through the atmosphere? So there are a lot of questions that we don't have answers to right now. So that's why we're still about 25 years out. People are anxious for, to go, but hopefully I've given you some ideas about how complicated it is and it's a much bigger step than going to the moon. So we think if we go and practice more on the moon and actually maybe practice living there for up to a year at a time, we can kind of ring out and practice all the technology and pick the best plan for the way to go. But I mean, once again, I, I really encourage you to think about it because we, we need you to grow up and solve those kinds of problems for us. So if I can just say you know, one last thing about that, we've talked about the challenges of food and your health, propellant, uh, how do you keep people alive? There's a psychological dimension to sending people on a two-year mission. So there's a teamwork. How do we do this as a country? How do we do it partnering with other countries? How do we deal with our cultural differences? So it truly is the challenge of your generation. So if you have questions for me, I, I give them back to you and ask you to solve them. That was okay, terrific. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much. So much. That was just terrific. Okay. Give my wife credit for the concept of the Apollo grant. Um, she um, knew that it was important that folks like you um, be experienced by students, young students, uh, and, and get to know you, you know, uh, up front, personal. And so we are very grateful for your visit. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you again. Thanks for such a warm welcome and great questions, too. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you know, I don't know if government employees can receive gifts, but I'm pretty sure ladies can receive <laughs> gifts. <laughs> so we have a gift for you, Pam. Thank it's you. a uh, glass sculpture oh. of the Atlanta flower, oh, which is the dogwood. Wonderful. And it's done by a local uh, sculpture. So we hope you'll enjoy that Thank and you. remember Atlanta. I know I will. And uh, she is going to visit three schools while she's here. She was at Tech High today. She'll be at Trinity tomorrow and at the Atlanta Girls School tomorrow afternoon, which is celebrating their 10th anniversary this year. And there'll be a whole lot of youngsters. We are so glad the students came tonight. I can't yes. tell you how, how gratifying this has been for everybody that had a part in tonight's event. And also, we have an assignment for the students. Who would you like to see next year? Just let us know, and we'll reach out to that person, as we <laughs> did to Pam, and try to bring a guest next year that you'd like to see or your colleagues would like to see. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. Have a safe trip home. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you. Thank you.